Well, we're continuing with uh, Ephesians. We're looking at the whole of this letter over the, the next uh, six or seven weeks. Uh, it is quite a chunk of scripture I've been asked to uh, look at, the uh, section from 1.13 to 2.10. Last week, uh, David looked at the introductory part of the, part of the chapter uh, where, in effect, he, he brought some photographs of scaffolding and... Um, we were saying that you know scaffolding is used to lift us up to be able to reach things we can't otherwise reach, and in the same way, um, it's as if Ephesians that Paul's setting us up. He wants us to be able to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, reach things also spiritually that we couldn't otherwise reach. So we looked at the supreme power and authority of the Lord Jesus. We looked at the fact of our adoption into His family, the Church. Uh, when we commit ourselves to him, he's the head of the church and also the purpose of each one of us in the church to bring his kingdom, as we say in the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. So um, grace, wisdom, forgiveness of sins, all these really positive things that flow from a Christian life and through a life lived in the power of the Holy Spirit, an assurance that we're loved and an assurance that we belong to him. That was really the setting of the, uh, the letter to the Ephesians. So I'm taking it up at verse 13, uh, and I've entitled this little section, Sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians is said by theologians and uh, Bible commentators to be the, the queen of the letters of St. Paul. Uh, in some of the letters, uh, 1 Corinthians, he's actually taking the church to task for some kind of unchristian lifestyle or some heresy that's developed. Uh, and he's writing a lot of his letters on the hoof, and he's having to react to situations that have cropped up and deal with them in his letters. But this one, we know, is written to the Ephesians from a situation where Paul was in a Roman prison. And uh, we know from Acts chapter 20 that he'd spent about three years among the Ephesians. So they were lovely Christian people, people he knew very well. He wasn't having to admonish them for anything. Um, is simply praising them uh, for their love and for their faith in the gospel. Um, they've believed the Lord, they've received salvation, now they're living their lives by it. And so that can be seen in terms of their faith in God and their love for the other Christian people in the church and indeed people outside the church as well. The church is growing. Uh, and the point he makes in this passage is that uh, they are now, the Ephesians, each sealed for all eternity with the Holy Spirit. Now, in the ancient world, uh, if you were sending a package or a, a parcel or a box, a crate, anywhere, you would mark it with a seal because there was no postal service and the, the item had to be marked with the person to whom it belonged and from whom it was coming, who it belonged to, and then the person who received it would know uh, whose it was. Um, similarly, in the logging industry in Canada, this doesn't happen nowadays because apparently um, I think uh, ships going up upstream on a river don't want to meet a thousand logs coming downstream. But in the old days, up to about 1970, they used to mark the logs with the mark of the owner and then dump them all in the river and float them downstream to the St. Lawrence from where they would be gathered together and exported. But it was the mark of the, the seal, the branding of the log with the owner's mark that um, when it got down to where it was going to be shipped off from, that, that, that's how they knew who it belonged to. And uh, similarly, <coughs> having the Holy Spirit... Um, we, um, and we receive the Holy Spirit at the moment we become a Christian. Once we have the Spirit, it is the seal of a person who belongs to God. The Holy Spirit, says Paul, is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the time of redemption of those who are God's possession. So that's good to know that we are his possession, that he, he holds us in the hollow of his hand and that what he's, he's taking hold of he isn't going to let us go. The Holy Spirit, if you like, is Christ's down payment for each one of us to secure an inheritance in heaven. Mary and I have just paid a down payment on a holiday in Denmark during the summer, and we know that having paid the deposit, it's sealed the deal, and we've got the summer house for the summer. Uh, we've probably got some more money to pay later on, but it, it's, the, it's the seal, if you like, 
um, we have some friends who've recently bought a house and they paid a deposit on the house and when you pay the deposit that again the contract is sealed and uh, the house is yours um, you may have to pay the balance you will have to pay the balance later on but at least you've got it uh, if a couple are engaged to be married and the uh, the man gives the uh, the lady an engagement ring it uh, it seals again what was originally uh, they were just going out together but now they're actually engaged to be married and so the giving of the holy spirit to us is christ in effect saying you've committed your life to me uh, i am yours and you are mine that's a lovely situation to be in so that's the first thing we are sealed by the holy spirit the second thing is realizing our resources. In verse 15, Paul says, Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And it clearly lifts Paul's spirits just to think about the Ephesians. He spent a lot of time with them, given three years of his ministry to them, and they're going on in the Lord, carrying the baton of faith and doing all the good works that he hoped they would do in response to their salvation in Christ. And um, I sometimes find myself thinking about people who've gone through this church. Mary and I have been coming here for about 30 years, I think, probably more. So we've seen a lot of people come, and it's lovely to know about people who've uh, gone through the church who've perhaps come through to faith and then they've gone to a church somewhere else and you know that they're still fighting the good fight and living out their faith for the Lord in some other part of the country um, doing Christian work so it lifts your spirits when you think about that it's very encouraging so that's what Paul is doing but he doesn't want it to stop there because he says in <coughs> verse 17 the God of our Lord Jesus the glorious father he wants uh, that Father to give you the Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him better. It's good to know Christ, but it's even better to know him better. So uh, to open the eyes of their hearts, and of course we sang the song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord, that's what we want to happen. Verse 18, so that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance. Verse 19, in the saints... And his incomparably great power to those who believe. And the pinnacle of that power, of course, is the power of God through the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. It did happen. Christ was bodily raised from the dead. And it's that fact uh, upon which our salvation depends. Paul says if, uh, if it didn't happen, it's a waste of time and we're all in our sins. But the fact is it did. And therefore we have the hope of glory ourselves uh, that uh, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead also will one day raise us so that we will be in heaven with him uh, most famous verse in scripture John three sixteen: for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life that's the purpose for which Jesus came and yet some Christians still live in a state of spiritual impoverishment, um, as if the gospel message hasn't sunk in. I was <coughs> reading recently about uh, a lady who worked for years in quite a menial capacity for uh, Walt Disney. She lived in quite a small flat um, as part of a job. She used to get a bit of a bonus every year, and she was given these bits of paper, and she used to file them away. And at the end of the next year, there'll be some more bits of paper. Uh, and she just continued doing this job and living in this quite small flat. And it was only when she died that they discovered the bits of paper were share certificates in the Disney Film Company, which had been in its infancy at the time, but which, of course, had mushroomed. And she was, in fact, a millionaire, but she didn't realise the resources that she'd got. And sometimes as Christians, we can be in the same position. Paul's saying to the Ephesians, know your inheritance, be aware of the spiritual resources that you have. And in effect, have a bigger understanding of God, who is, it says in uh, chapter 3, he's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of 
all sorts of things. The power of prayer we have. If you pray for something, there is power in prayer and we need to all be praying for all sorts of situations and people. The power of healing. God has given us power to heal, sometimes naturally, but sometimes through the power of the Holy Spirit quite supernaturally. The power of encouragement, just you coming alongside somebody and encouraging them is a, is a great thing to breathe strength into their lives. Um, the power of generosity and kindness and giving, God has given us so much and we have got the power to be able to give on, uh, to pay it forward as it were. Uh, the power of friendship is a great source of strength to many people to know that there are Christian people alongside you who uh, you know want the best for you and the power of forgiveness uh, is of course an amazing gift to actually forgive somebody and to release them from whatever it is um, and he wants them to be aware of, of the Christian trinity did you know that there were three trinities in the Bible, because I didn't before I prepared this sermon, but there is the, uh, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the evil trinity, the flesh, the world, and the devil, and the Christian trinity, faith, hope, and love. And the believers in Ephesus have certainly got faith and love um, they, they love each other, they love the people outside, and they've got great faith in the Lord. But Paul wants them to have the, all three, he wants them to have hope as well. And uh, those three things should be the mark of every believer. Hope, the hope of glory in our hearts, we sing in one of our Christian worship songs. Uh, and Paul wants the Eph Ephesian believers to add to their faith um, this gift of hope. Uh, hope for the church, hope for the future, um, hope for the world. Because although, you know, when we commit our lives to Christ and give our lives to him, there are many people outside in the world who haven't done yet, and yet there is hope that they will do so. He died for them as much as he did for you and for me. So if this world, if I was an atheist, and um, if this world was all that there was, then it would be really important to, to um, well, to go to as many places in the world as I could, to live as long as I could, to look as young as I could, and to gain as many experiences as I could. But if actually, as Paul is saying here, we have this massive inheritance in Christ that goes on into eternity, what does it matter if... We go to Skegness for a week for our holidays instead of our friends perhaps spending three weeks in the Maldives. It really, in the grand scheme of things, does not matter. The main thing is that we have our being in Christ and all our hope is vested in him. That's where our inheritance is. Interestingly, these um, wind turbines, uh, there are quite a lot of them off the shore of Skegness. If you've ever been to Spring Harvest and walked on the seafront, um, and it just reminded me of Jesus saying, the wind blows where it will. We don't know where it's going. We don't know where it comes from. Uh, but obviously there's power in the wind. And it's this analogy, if you like, between the wind and the spirit. And if only we can harness the power of the Holy Spirit, just like those wind turbines are harnessing the power of the wind to trans translate it into energy. If we can gain the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and uh, if we can be conduits through whom the power of the spirit can be passed to a needy world to our families to other people in the church even then that's what it's all about uh, the power of the spirit so that's the second thing the third thing is that we are made alive in Christ and this is the bit that's found in chapter 2 verses 1 to 10 Paul talks about how the Ephesians were before they knew Christ and how they are now. I found this quite interesting um, picture online of this tree before and after, as it were. The left-hand side is all bleak, black and white, winter, cold, no leaves, dead. And yet the one on the right is, in effect, how it's become. Um, it's full of life, the sap's flowing again, the leaves are green, 
There's a blue sky, it's summer, it's warm, and there's life. And uh, Paul talks to the Ephesians, he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's an expression that Paul used to use of the devil. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. He then goes on to say that we were dead in our transgressions, spiritually dead, um, and in our sins and other religions point to a series of things that you can do to atone for your sins. You can perform certain rituals, you can go to certain places, um, but actually doing things doesn't revive doesn't somehow put right the wrong things that we did. We've still done the wrong things. We've still transgressed. We're still um, potentially not in a relationship with God if we've breached his holy law. So we're dead in our transgressions. Um, but in actual fact, it isn't put right by, by doing other things, uh, you know, by having more right things in the in one side of the balance than there are wrong things in the other side. That just doesn't work. I mean, to give an example, I had a friend, this is quite a few years ago, who um, did 65 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. And it wasn't my wife. It was, uh, it was a, a very, very sweet lady in her mid forties at the time. Um, she'd been working in a restaurant quite late uh, the customers had been a long time leaving. They then had to cash up and lock up. And by the time she left, it was about 2.30 in the morning and the roads were absolutely clear. It was on Scorby Road. And she did 65 miles an hour to get home quickly to get to bed. And unfortunately for her, uh, a police officer dozing off in his car must have been quite, uh, must have livened things up for him quite a bit to see <laughs> Connie shooting past at 65 as if she was on the M1. And uh, she was pulled over. Now, she could have had a conversation with him and she could have said, look, officer, um, I, I didn't go through any red traffic lights on the way up the road. I, uh, if you can breathal breathalyze me, if you like, I haven't touched a drop. My tyres are absolutely fantastic. I've got all my vehicle documentation in order. Um, you know, I'm fully insured. He would have said, madam, that may be the case, but you were doing 65 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. And that's the way it is with us. We can, we can plead, if you like, all the right things we may have done and probably ought to have done anyway. But the fact that we've transgressed in just one area means that, as Paul puts it in Romans 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we may regard ourselves as, um, we may say, yes, we are sinners, but we're not as bad a sinner as a murderer um, or as a as a child abuser or as a terrorist. Um, but that isn't the point. The thing is that God's standard is perfection. So wherever we depart from that, we um, fail to come up to the standard. And um, Jesus um, was for everybody. That's what Jesus was for everybody. He, he gave his life for us so that whatever we'd done wrong, God would not look at us, but they'd, he would look at, at Jesus and uh, say, because you've put your trust in my son, who never did a single wrong thing, that your sins are taken away. Um, and in these crucial verses, uh, 8 and 9, um, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by work, so that no one can boast. And I was just trying to imagine a heaven, if you can call it that, where people could boast about what they'd done. You know, you get to heaven and, uh, well, how did you get here? I, I tithed my gross income. Oh, well, I, I gave up um, two weeks every year 
uh, during the summer to run a holiday club and I did such and such a good gift, a good deed or whatever it might be. And the thing is that uh, that is not what gets us to heaven and I suspect heaven would not be a very nice place if we were all boasting about the good things that we thought we'd done. The fact is, um, Paul says, it is not by work so that no one can boast. It's only by accepting for ourselves the free gift that Jesus has given to us by dying on the cross, the only perfect human life that ever did live, and uh, he paid the price for our sin on the cross. The Bible commentator and theologian William Barclay uh, says that God is love and that sin is therefore a crime, not against law, but against love. And uh, he makes the point that it's possible to um, at make atonement when we break the law, but it's impossible to atone for a broken heart. So sin is not so much breaking God's law. I mean, it is that, but it's actually breaking God's heart. So just to give another crude analogy, turning back to the world of driving, if a man um, kills a child whilst he's driving his car, he's arrested, he stands trial, he's convicted, found guilty, um, and he serves a term of imprisonment. That, as far as the law is concerned, is the end of the matter. He's served his sentence, that's it. But it's far from the end of the matter for the mother whose child was killed. And it's only by her in an act of forgiveness, forgiving that man for what he's done, that he's released from his transgression, if you like, in that respect. And it's the same with us and God, that we cannot atone for our sin by doing good works, but only by seeking his forgiveness in repentance, coming before him and saying, Lord, I do want to know you, I do know you, I do love you, I want to give my life to you, and I want to know that I am forgiven for all the wrong things that I've ever done. And uh, that really is what we do when we come to Jesus and give our lives to him and accept through grace, through faith, by, by virtue of his grace towards us, the, the gift that is given to us. And uh, again, grace, what is it? It's, we often learnt in Sunday school, God's riches at Christ's expense. Uh, undeserved favour is the other way in which grace is often described and that's what God in Christ has done for us. He's paid the price himself and so all the good works that we do are not because we're trying to earn our salvation or earn God's love but rather they are a profound thankfulness as we respond by doing all we can to pass on the love and the kindness to others by I don't know, being the best husband that you can, by being the best wife that you can, by being the best friend that you can, by being the best employee at work that you can, by being the best employer that you can, by being the best work colleague that you can, by being the best friend that you can. Um, we cannot earn God's love we can only seek uh, as a response to our salvation to be the best that we can for him um, and show it by letting him know, Lord, we are grateful. Uh, we're grateful to you for all that you've done for us and to show him that gratitude um, by seeking with our whole hearts to live the kind of life which will bring joy to God's heart. So... Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift in our Lord Jesus. Amen.